the day, let me say to you, share with you a disclaimer. Are you ready? Do not attempt to do any of what I am about to preach without a right relationship with God. Do not attempt to do anything that I'm about to preach without a right relationship with Yahweh, because if you do, you will fail miserably. You will come up short. Anything that we try to do, no matter how much success we have doing it, whatever we do without Yahweh will always come up short of whatever we can do with Him. He will always, say this with me, He will always always enable me me to do more with Him him than I could ever do do without Him. him. Now, what I want to talk about today, this whole timing is everything theme, is going to revolve around the, those words, those visions, those dreams uh, that He has put in your heart. I hope that while I have been teaching this Kingdom Incorporated series, you've been waking up. Things have been popping in your mind and in your spirit. Things have been coming alive in you. You've been stirred about some things that you need to do you haven't done just because you didn't know to do it. But I hope that things have been waking up in you, and that not just in this series, but in each series that we have done, that you are waking up and and becoming more and more aware of what your potential is, what the possibilities are for you. That is my hope. Now, the danger in becoming aware of what my possibilities are is that I want to now tell everybody what my possibilities are. I want to go out and I want to broadcast it. I want to get a megaphone and I want to go out there and turn that little switch on and I want to get everybody's attention. Sort of like the wedding yesterday with Norris and Jaquanda and little Lala. She comes running down the aisle before the bride came in with a bell. The bride is coming. The bride is coming. The bride is... You know, and then she got up here on the step and she turned around and rung the bell. The bride is coming. And then the bridal march started and and the bride came in. And that's really kind of what we want to do is, is not just believers, but as human beings, human beings. That's what we want to do is we want to get out there and when something comes to us, we want to broadcast it. We want to make sure that everybody's aware, Madison. Hey, the bride is coming. Hey, the groom is coming. Hey, this is something awesome that's stirring in me. Hey, guess what? Everybody, let me have your attention. And then when we have everybody's attention, we tell them everything we know. You know, and we become childlike because children are that way. And I love that children are that way. Children are innocent. They're learning that way. But see, children learn too. Just like adults learn, children learn that there, it depends on where they grow up at or what kind of environment they grow up in. But they'll have all these dreams and all these, this knowledge that comes to them and all this understanding and wisdom that comes to them. And, and, and they'll arrive at this place. And when they arrive at this place of understanding this new thing that they just discovered, First thing they, can, they have to do is go find mama and daddy. Guess what I can do? I remember even as a kid, the first time I ever did a one and a half flip off a diving board, a high dive. I was so, that's all I ever did and it never looked good. But let me just say, I thought it looked good because I was a kid. And my mother's watching today, so she'll remember this. But we were at a uh, public pool. And I remember so excited because my cousin and I had gotten out here and we had, got, we had to go to a public pool. That's the only pool we had then. And we went to this public pool, and we got up on this, and we had seen, watched these, I was probably 10-ish maybe, and 11 maybe, and the high dive, you know, they have the normal dive that's, what, four or five feet off the water. Then what was high dive to me was probably maybe 10 or 15 feet off the water. It wasn't really high, but when you're 10 or 11, that's high. And uh, so, especially when you're bouncing. I don't know that I bounced, but Everything didn't end up the way I wanted it to end up. But um, we get up there. Well, we're watching these people. And my cousin, Rick, he said, hey, man, he said, let's go. Let's go. We can do that. Well, man, I mean, they look like Olympic stars. These people get up there, man. They're running out there, bouncing, and then they do this beautiful flip. They're doing back things, and they're flipping into this pool. And back then, pools could be really deep. I mean, they were real deep. And this is in Texas, and it was just different. But the, um, they're doing these flips, and they're just loving life. So my cousin says, let's do that. We can do that. I was like, okay. You know, you're a kid. You, you can do anything. 
You can fly, put a, tape a feather to my back and I'll jump off a building. It's ridiculous what you think you can do. And so we climb up on that diving board that seemed high to us. And, and I don't remember who went first, but one of us went. And then ultimately I went. And I got out there. I'm nervous, man. I mean, everything in me. I'm a kid. And I still remember. It's like the first time I did it. I'm, I'm, everything in me, my guts were turning. And, and I'm thinking, you know, that's, but then I just, you know, when you're a kid, again, it's just water. Water's really soft, pliable. It moves out of the way when you touch it comes apart how bad can it be so I get up there and believe it or not believe it or not I run to the board I go to the end of the board and look over and then I get back and I take off running and I jump and and I do the, uh, just beautiful it was beautiful to me it didn't hurt everything was great first time I ever did it I did a one and a half flip I did the flip and straight in head first did the flip it was beautiful I was so excited I went to my mom mom watch this Watch what I can do. Watch this. this I mean, I, I had to tell it, man. I just came into this new knowledge. I can do a one and a half dive. First time I ever did it. I can do a one and a half dive. I get up on that dive board and I run out there. I'm just, again, I just did it. I'm thinking this is going to be beautiful. Man, I get over there and if you've ever felt water hit you like a concrete wall, I ran out there and things just didn't go the same. And I ran out there and I did the bouncy and I did the flip but instead of going head first I didn't go over far enough and I went face just like this it felt like it shoved my eyeballs out my ears it hurt my belly I did a I mean it was bad in every way I don't know that this is true or not but I'm pretty certain it is I don't think I ever ask anybody to ever watch me dive again But I, do, I don't know if that's true, but I know that this is true. I have never in my entire life ever attempted a one and a half dive again. Because I found out that, that day, I am not Mark Luganis. That, that is good. I am not an Olympic diver. I realized that's just not going to work. That's not my calling. And I've never done. Now, I'll do other things. I'll do a backflip all day long. I'll stand on the edge and go backwards and, you know, all day. But the nature of children is if I hear it, if I learn it, if I figure it out, I've got to tell it. But then along the way, sometimes in the telling of it, even as a child, hear what I'm telling you. We hope, Sydney. That in every environment that a child feels safe enough to share their dreams and their visions and their newfound knowledge with whoever will listen. And they do in the beginning. But then times pass and they find themselves in an environment of one sort or another. And they find themselves in this situation where perhaps it's a parent, perhaps it's an aunt or an uncle or a friend or a cousin or a whomever, a teacher, whoever. And they say, oh, where'd you learn that? You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, that's only for the other people. You can't do that. Right. Stop believing that. I don't want you to disappoint yourself, so just don't, don't tell anybody, don't say anything else like that. So along the way, they get this dream, they get this revelation, they get this knowledge, they want to run out and they want to tell the world. Well, that seed never leaves us. The need to tell it is always present. The need to blurt it on out there is always present in us because that's the nature of Adam. I found a tree. I found a fruit. I found out what it could produce. The need is always present to go and to blurt that thing out. Well, just like children as they grow up and, and somebody that comes into their life with a little bent idea on what it is to really help someone to, to establish their roots and their means and their abilities and their dreams and their visions, someone with a bent, twisted uh, understanding of what it is to encourage and to grow people up says to them, you can't do that. That'll never happen for you. We can't afford that, or you can't, whatever the reason. I don't know what the reason is, but whatever the reason, somebody comes along, and then later on, and then the kids begin to stop believing. How many children, let's make it personal, how many people are in this room, when you were a child, you had a dream in you, and you knew with everything in you, you could be that thing, but somewhere along the way, someone kept telling you you can't, and you gave up on it. 
And when you think about it today, you still haven't become that. When you think about it today, you, you're still wondering, what if they had told me to go for it instead of saying, ah, not you. What if they had said, how can I empower you? How can I enable you to do that thing instead of saying, oh, not you, not now, not today, not our family. No one will ever listen to you. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, yeah, I know you do. Oh, that's sweet. Go play. Go play with other toys now. Don't think about that because you're going to get disappointed. And, and, and I wonder just how many people really come to that place. But here's the thing. The seed never dies of the desire, the want, the dream, the vision. Those things don't die in us. And you know it's a revelation. You know the dream and the vision came from God when you don't ever stop thinking about it. If it comes and goes, it's not God, it's you. But whenever there's something in you that you can't push away, shove away, nobody can talk away, nobody can put down, it's still in you, doesn't... It's irrelevant at the moment, right now. Everybody say right now. Right now. Only right now. It's irrelevant whether or not it's fulfilled or come to pass. Right now, that's irrelevant. What's relevant is, if it's of God, it's still alive. There's still something there in you. There's still something that's burning in you. I hope I'm waking some things up even right now. Who you really want to be. What you really want to do. Kingdom Incorporated is about changing our society. It's about changing. It's about becoming those people who are in seats of authority instead of always being those people who are under someone else's authority. That's right. It's about us making the rules instead of always finding ourselves coming under the rules of Babylon. The dreams that the Father put in your heart will always, if they came from the Father, the revelations that He gives you and the dreams that He gives you will always lend to you and I coming to the place where we become uh, uh, equipped to be positioned to begin to be the authority and to rule and reign the way He created us to rule and reign. It will always produce that. No matter what it is, whether a CEO, a teacher, a lawyer, attorney, a, 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 I don't know, pool, I don't know, whatever it is, you, whatever you, whatever's in your heart. It will always produce the opportunity for you to be seated in, a, in the kind of seat that has the kind of authority that can make his name great. We don't rewrite rules because we think about rewriting rules. We rewrite rules because we reposition ourselves. But see, too many people today, everybody say this with me, say timing is everything. everything. Too many of us today have stopped believing for that bigger thing, that thing that will put us in a place where we can actually have some authority, rule and reign. When I say authority, don't get squirmish because of that. Oh, you know what, this whole authority thing, government thing, don't, you need to embrace that. You need to embrace it. See, uh, one of the things that, and I'll say this real quick, what bothers me about picket lines and all these marches and all that stuff is it's, it looks pretty on TV and CNN can make it shine real good and they can do all these and all these stupid marches and they're all stupid and it's, that's politically incorrect. They're all foolish. <laughs> Nobody's changing anything. And whatever they do change, they're only going to change during one administration. You really want to change something? Change your life. Before you get everybody else to change their mind, how about changing yours first? You change the decisions that you make, and it will change the decisions that are affected by the decision that you made. Does anybody hear me in this place this morning? So timing is everything, and how we do it, and we'll understand this in a moment. So they've quashed this thing, and the dreams, and the realities, and the danger is, the the challenge is, the, the unfortunate thing is that while that was true when we were a child, that still remains with us when we're an adult. We still want to tell everybody. It was beautiful as a child. That part never goes away from us from wanting to tell it. Now, as a child, we should have been able to tell it. As an adult, we should be able to shout it from the mountaintops and everybody accept it. But here is the reality. If you haven't learned this yet, the reality of it is if you tell it all, somebody's going to chew a lot of it up and spit it back at you. Because people don't have the faith in your dreams and your visions like you do. People will not have the confidence in your dreams and your visions like you do. But let me help you accept that. It isn't their responsibility. If he gave you the dream and the vision, and you're expecting someone else to help you carry out that dream and that vision, and you think by blabbing it and telling everybody about that dream and that vision is going to get people to help you carry out that vision, 
You're putting people in a position they were never called to be in. You're giving them some authority over your dream and vision they were never meant to have. So they're going to begin to judge your dream and vision based on how they think you should walk out your dream and vision. Am I making any sense? So how do we do this? Because my nature is I want to get out there and I want to yell it out there. Man, I got this revelation of who I am. I've got this revelation about what I am. And I just think the whole world's going to get excited about it with me. And I'm going to go out there and I blab it to the whole world. Well, they're not excited. Why aren't they excited? This one is and that one is. But why is everybody else sending me ugly emails and all of a sudden ignoring me and pretending like I don't exist? Why are there people that are shaming me? Let's read about this. Let's find out about it this morning. Turn with me to the book of John chapter 7, please. Book of John chapter 7, and it reads like this, beginning with verse 1. I'm going to read uh, some of it in the English Standard and some of it in the New King James. Book of John, verse 7, says this. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not... Go about in Judea. Everybody say this with me. Say it again. Say, Jesus, Jesus. went about. He made his way, whatever, however you want to say it, whatever version you're reading, in Galilee. But he would not go about in Judea. That's all you have to say. Thank you. Because the Jews were seeking to kill him. He wasn't interested in being killed prematurely. Here's the crazy thing. He knew that that was his purpose. But he also understood his time. Timing is everything. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee, and he would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers, they said to him, Jesus, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. We think it's cool what you're doing in Galilee. But we want you to go to Judea and do this because we want them to see it too. It is awesome, the things that you are doing. And then they said, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. They're saying this to Christ. No one does the things in secret that you're doing if they want to be known openly. If you're going to do these things, this is what they're saying to him, If you are going to do these things, these miracles, these signs, and these wonders, then show yourself to the world. If this is who you are, let the world know it. For not even his brothers believed in him. And Jesus said to them, no. My time has not yet come. But your time is always here. That's sarcasm. I'll explain it in a second. He said, no, I'm not going to go and I'm not going to show it to the world because my time has not yet come. But your time is always here. What does that mean? What's he really saying by that? Let me point something out to you today. The nature of the world today is... Let everybody know what's going on. Facebook is a courtroom. Instagram is a courtroom. Snapchat is a courtroom. And the judge is whoever's reading what you put on it. Because the nature of man is, I want to tell everybody everything that I'm doing. I want everybody to know. Now, just like Adam, we do it under false pretenses. Well, I don't really want everybody to know what I'm doing. I just want them to celebrate with me. You know, all these things that are going on. I'm going to tell you something right now. Let me just be real about it right now. Instagram, about to drive me. I see too, too much of too many people. If you have found that I have unfriended you on Instagram, it's because I've seen your belly one too many times. Or your mirror image. If I want to see it, I'm going to ask you to see it. (laughs) 
And if you're wondering why I haven't asked, I'm not interested. And if I'm a husband or a wife, and my husband or my wife, well, not my, not my husband. How can I word that right? Just go with me. My spouse is putting it out there. What are you thinking? I hope I am stepping on a thousand toes. Why am I saying all this? Because that is the nature of Adam. I'm going to tell everybody, I want everybody to experience everything that's going on in my world. And I'm really excited about this and this and this and whatever it is. I'm putting it all out there. I'm going to tell it if I'm thinking it. I want everybody to see it, watch it, witness it. And meanwhile, I'm unfriending. You're out. So if you go home today and you find out you're no longer in my list, I've seen all of you I want to see. My wife is about to bury herself right now. I'm just trying to be real here because this is the nature of Adam. Now, I understand that it's innocent. I understand the the culture today that we live in, this is innocence, but I'm trying to educate the culture. Can we rearrange the culture a little bit? Why does our culture have to look like that culture? Can we shift that a little bit? Uh, let's, little, let's take one step at a time. We give, we, uh, again, let's not use a cannon when we can use a pistol. A little bit at a time. Because that's the nature. And Jesus said, listen, my time has not yet come. And listen, before your time comes, I don't want to see about your time coming. I don't want to see those moments. I don't want to hear about them. Nobody else does either. And the reality of it is, every, every person that sees your, your picture, every person that sees your post, your statement, Because Facebook, Instagram, these social platforms, they are all courtrooms. You need to hear what I'm saying. If you're watching online, those social platforms, every one of them is a courtroom. And every person that reads it, sees it, looks at it, and comments on it, they are a judge in that courtroom. And if you get mad because you didn't like what somebody said on there, that's too bad because you submitted it to the courtroom. You don't have a right to say, you shouldn't have said that. Somebody needs to hear what I'm telling you today. Timing is everything. Just trying to help us learn a little bit. He said, for not even his brothers believed in him. And Jesus said to them, he said, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Why did he say that? Again, that's sarcasm. Because Jesus said this. He said, I understand timing. And I understand that the Jews want to kill me, and they're going to kill me. But they're not going to kill me today. Timing is everything. He said, so the reason I'm not revealing myself the way that you want me to reveal myself today, while it's all in me, I'm not going to expose it all to everybody. Because right now it is in me, and I'm going to keep in me what should remain in me for now, and I'm going to let out what I need to let out for now. But I'm going to discern by the Holy Spirit what needs to stay right now and what needs to be released right now. And it all, just because I got it today, doesn't mean I have to post it today. Anybody hearing me? But here's the sarcasm part. And he said, but for you, it's always. Your time is always. He wasn't saying, you know what? It's really cool because I've enabled you guys to be able to talk about all. He was shaming them. He was saying, you know what? I I have discernment. Y'all have none. Well, I know when timing is right. Y'all have no discernment at all, and you just talk all the time. You're on Facebook all the time. You're on Instagram all the time. Everybody knows all your business. They're all in your business. There's no secrets about your life. There's people in this, in this house. I love everybody, and I, I'm going to be misinterpreted in a thousand ways. I, I'm trying not to be. But there's people in this house. I know way more about you than I want to know. 
I don't need to know that to be a good leader. In fact, here's the danger. Sometimes I find out things about you that make me sad. Coming to that knowledge disappointed me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And that's true for you. Sometimes they'll throw this stuff out here and they'll put it all out there and, and all of a sudden you realize, I didn't even know that they, that was in them. Well, maybe you needed to know. You know, I just have this weird thing about trusting Holy Spirit to bring things out when He wants to bring them out and not people telling me all about it whenever they feel like they need to let it go. I just have this real confidence that Holy Spirit will reveal what needs to be revealed at a time when instead of it being disappointment is an opportunity for healing. Am I making any sense? He said, my time has not yet come, but your time, it's always here because you're always telling everybody everything. He said, and I wish you could really get the revelation of what I'm telling you today. He said, the world cannot hate you because you're very much a part of it. They're never going to hate you. You're involved in everything they're doing. They create another platform, you're on it. They decide these are the new rules, you, you, you buy those rules. They decide this is what's morally acceptable, you buy into that. They're never going to hate you because you just accept whatever they throw out there. You have no lines because they have no lines. The only difference between you and them is you go to church on Sunday morning sometimes. The world will not hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that the work, its works are evil. He said, my life is a testimony against it. I'm a mystery to the world. You're not a mystery. You're a wide open book. They know you. All that, that was sarcasm. That whole beginning statement started with sarcasm. He said, listen, I'm a mystery. They don't know because while they're going to kill me, they don't know that they're going to kill me yet. I know that, and I'm not going to tell them today because it would be premature. It would be out of timing. Timing is everything. He said, but it's always the case for you. And he said, listen, he said, they don't hate you. They don't despise you because you look just like them. I'm not saying that about you. I'm just saying that about those that this applies to. I'm just saying what he's saying. I'm not saying it about you that are watching online. I'm just saying that about those to whom this applies. And if this applies to you, you can't get mad at me. You can't say, oh, that preacher's judgmental. I'm releasing a word today that is judging you, but I'm not the judge. The anointing might be judging you, but I am not the judge. The anointing is the Holy Ghost, sent to judge, sent to equip, sent to rebuke, sent to encourage, sent to exhort, sent to convict, sent to reprove. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. The world will not hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. He said, i tell you what, let's do this. By this point, this conversation had gone on long enough where, the, where Christ understood that there is no chance I'm going to walk into any room with this group of people. <laughs> Are y'all tracking with me? He realized at this point, I don't want to be seen with this group of people. Now, he loved them, but he understood there is no chance I'm walking into any kind of conference with these people. I'm not going into town with them. I'm not riding the same bus with them. And whatever camel they're on, I'm going to be on the one that's way behind them. <laughs> He said, so let's do this. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm beginning to figure you all out. You put everything on Instagram and social media and let everybody know your stuff. You're sending letters and emails and you tell everybody at the water cooler at work all about all your stuff and your details and your worries and your concerns, even your dreams and your visions that you just, you just pour it all out there. If it, if it comes into your mind, you just, you just puke it on everything and everybody. He said, so now that I figured you out, well, I understand discernment. And he said, you're just always telling it all and doing it all the time. He said, and since the world doesn't hate you and blah, blah, it hates me, um, we're probably not going to be good company for one another. He said, so I tell you what, this is what we're going to do. He said, you go up to the feast. Go ahead and go. He said, I'm not going to the feast. That's what he says. This is verse 8. He said, you go up to the feast. I'm not going to the feast because I still understand my time has not yet fully come. 
But again, your time is always here. In your world, it's always your time. Because, I mean, like, you own it. Because in today's culture, who's going to tell me what to do? My time is always here. I am it. And Jesus said, you go up to the feast. He was being very nice, very gracious. Because what he was thinking was what I said a moment ago. I will not be found anywhere near you because we are nothing alike. You go up to the feast. He said, I'm not going to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, verse 9 says, he remained in Galilee. But what does verse 10 say? But when his brothers had gone up, once they had left, everybody say, once they had left, and once there was space between him and them, you don't have to say that. But once he realized, okay, I've given them a head start, no one is going to confuse the fact that we might be together. When his brothers had gone up, then, everybody say then. When his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast. He said he wasn't going to. Did he lie to them? No. He just said, I'm not going with you. They might have interpreted it, and they probably said, you said you weren't coming. No. I just said I wasn't going with you. I was going to remain in Galilee. I didn't say whether that was going to be for five minutes, five days, five hours, five what I, I just said, you go. And I'm going to remain in Galilee. You went, and I remained, and then I went. I put space between me and you. Because had I gone with you, what you were going to do was, because you were more proud of the fact that you thought you looked so much like me. You thought we were so similar. You just wanted to be in my crowd. You wanted it to look like we were together. You wanted to make sure everybody would give you some clout because they would give me some clout. But we're nothing alike. So you were going to walk in there and just try to stay within my ring of aura. You were just going to try to stay within my circle so that everybody associated us together, but we're not together. We're not together. He said, because what you need to understand today is you're pouring it all out. You spill all the beans. I can't do that. I can only give a little at a time because if I gave it all right now, they would kill me prematurely and none of these people would come to know God. Redemption was determined on whether or not Christ could keep within himself the dream, the vision, the purpose that was to be held as a secret until its appointed time. Had he released it before its determined time or appointed time, it would have never produced the results of you and me today. We would not be standing here walking out our relationship with a father because of what Christ did, had he spilled it. And he knew these, all they wanted to do was be seen with him because he was the big dog. He says, when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, openly, but as it were in secret. Why? Again, same reason. Because he knew, if I go with them, these guys post everything. I need to be invisible when I get there. Does anybody know anybody that posts everything? I know about how many? I, I know too many. If I go with them, they're going to post it. I won't even be there. I don't have a phone, but I won't even. They'll be on, they'll be on there, whatever. Palm leaf. Writing it out. We're with Jesus. We're going to be there in about 45 minutes. Get ready. Yeah. Hashtag. hashtag. (laughs) 
He said, but then he went, not openly, but as it were in secret. And he knew, if they go, if I go with them, man, they're going, they're, because they're just proud, they're just happy to be. I'm, he, I'm sure he was glad that they wanted to be with him. But he was not okay with them wanting to spill it before its appointed time. Because he knew in order for it to produce its complete work, it had to be according not to the timing that he deemed fit, but the timing that the Father deemed fit. The Father sets things in order. And whatever his order is, that needs to become our want for order. Our desire for order. So they take off walking, he sends them up there, and he goes, but he goes not openly, but as it were, in secret. He still gets there, but he is not exposed before his time. Why am I telling you all of this? There's another scripture I'm going to read in just a second. In fact, you can begin turning there to Matthew chapter 7. I'm telling you all of this because the danger in our lives, remember, timing is everything. The danger in our lives is that the Father puts things in you, and I am cautioning you. I believe that what the Father is doing with this house is He is raising up people. We are going to begin to be seated in places we didn't even think we could be seated in. You are about to be positioned in places that are political. You're going to be positioned in places that are governmental. You are going to be seated in positions that are uh, business owners. You are going to be seated in positions that have authority. I wonder how many people, and I'm asking this question today, and I know that it's online, but how many people feel like you are seated in a seat today where you really don't have any authority? It's okay to answer. How many people are in here, you're seated, I'm talking naturally, not spiritually, but you're seated in a place where wherever you are, you don't really feel like you have much authority to bring change to anything. That's quite a few people, and probably more than that would be true. And you're seated there. That isn't his intent for you. That is not his purpose for you, nor is that his purpose for me. But there's a time of preparation that we need to respect. There is a time and a season where he is preparing us that we have to respect. Keeping in mind that other people will not always recognize your potential and will not respect you without first achieving. Until you achieve your dream, they won't give you any respect. So we tell people things, and I caution us, and I'll get back to this in a second, but we tell people things, we get it all out there, it doesn't get any respect, it gets scorn most of the time. They scorn you, or they smile in your face, and then they go home and they tell their husband, ah, you know what they told me today, can you believe that they really believe this is going to happen in their life? In your face, I'll be praying for you. They get home over chicken. I can't even believe they think that that's possible. I'm telling the truth. Nobody's going to go home today and eat chicken. (laughs) Not true. So let me get to Matthew 7. Be careful who you share your dreams with. Ask yourself this question. Can they handle my vision? And I'm going to give you the answer right now. Probably not. Well, no, I've known them all my life. You know, they've always been supportive of me. I'm telling you, see, when you understand what dream and vision he puts in your heart, it's bigger than you are. It's one thing to tell somebody I'm going to get my college education. It's another thing to tell somebody what I'm going to do with it. I can get my college education without a word. But if I want to do everything I'm supposed to do with that, I need a word from the Lord because he might turn that into something it didn't look like it was supposed to be. You need to hear me today. So be careful who you share your dreams with because you need to know, can they handle the vision? And the answer is probably not. There's a comment, a phrase that I have used in the past about circumstances and situations, and I tell, I've told the staff, my staff has, has heard it, the presbytery's heard it, maybe you've heard it in this congregation before, but I've used the phrase, never use a cannon when you can use a pistol. Don't pull out your big guns first. If you're in a situation, could be good or bad or somewhere in the middle, but don't, you don't pull out everything that you've got and just unload it right off the bat. 
Don't just put it all out there and say, you know what, I'm just going to put an end to this right now. I'm going to nip it in the bud and I'm just going to take everything I've got and just poo-poo it right out there on everything. I'm going to stop this thing right now. You have nothing left. You have nothing left. You've used the biggest gun you've got. You have nothing left. But if, if you start small and you begin to address whatever this thing is that's in front of you and you begin to bite this off a little bit at a time with, with the little choices that you can make, there's always still something in your... Uh, I, I, I'm a little restrained to use the word arsenal, but in your, in your bag, there's a little something still left there to come back and, and fall on and begin to use. Start small. Expose your intentions slowly and carefully. You don't want to go up to somebody and say, man, I got a revelation from the Holy Ghost and this is what he shared with me and I'm going to be this and you're just, all of a sudden you've turned yourself into what somebody said in the first service, Bill Gates. It's Bill Gates and you're going to go tell everybody that you're Bill Gates. You know what that'll do for you? Do exactly what scripture says it will do in the scripture we're about to read. It will do exactly that and this is what it will do. It will cause the people like Bill Gates or the people that own those companies, if you're going to try to start a company to compete with them, they're right now, they're the ones with all the power. And they're going to make sure that you don't get to ship whatever it is you're making. They're going to make sure that they buy up all the supplies so that there's none left for you. You don't pull your big guns out. You begin to share this thing as Holy Spirit tells you to share it. But in the meantime, you're in a time of preparation. You're letting him begin to build this thing up. You're doing things in secret, as it were. That's what Christ said. Are we doing it in secret because we're ashamed of it, we're embarrassed? No, you're doing it in secret because you're protecting the word. You are guarding the word until the appointed time. You want to be able to do it? You want to be able to succeed at this thing? You want to be able to catch? We want to catch the enemy by surprise. When this thing is revealed, we want the enemy to say, where did that come from? Oh, it's been in me all my life. But the time of revealing didn't come until now. And guess what? Now your time's up. Isn't that where we want to be? Start small. Expose your intention slowly and cautiously. Timing is everything. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 reads like this. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs. I like, again, the King James Version better right here. Do not cast your pearls before the swine. It just has more of a mm to it. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, because they will trample them underfoot and then turn and eat you up. Then they will turn and they will attack you. Let me read it again. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Why? 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 We are cautioned in numerous places in Proverbs throughout Scripture. We are cautioned about spilling all the beans prematurely. We are exhorted to understand and to recognize and to discern appointed times, the seasons. When is it right? When is it not right? All through Scripture, Holy Spirit prepares us to be aware that there is a right timing to everything that we do. And that just because it comes to us doesn't mean we immediately give it all away. The reason I wanted to read out of John and talk about the story of Christ and when he stayed in Galilee instead of going to Judea was so that you could see if it was okay for Christ to keep some things within him and to keep some secrets to himself. It's okay for you to do the same thing. Come to the place where you do not believe by keeping it back you're lying to somebody when they say what's in your heart. Tell us what we need to know, but not what we don't need to know. Understand how much, understand what BB gun you need to use right now. When they ask, don't give them the cannon. Just put a little bit out there. You hear what I'm saying today? And he says, don't give to the dogs what is holy. Because they're never going to interpret what holy is. They don't know what's holy or unholy. I understand that you think your dog's going to heaven. I'll let you do whatever you want with that. I love my dog. But I'm not certain he's going to be in the sweet, sweet by and by. Oh, everybody's gasping. Don't gasp. Some people think so. I'll let you think that.
But they don't understand what is holy and what is unholy. My belief is biblical. If you, don't, if you can't discern what is righteous and what is unrighteous, you can't make a decision to accept Christ. And He's the only way you're making it to the kingdom. I'm just going to leave that there. He says, don't cast, don't give what is holy to the dogs because they can't interpret it. And don't cast your pearls to the swine because they're not pearls to a pig. They're rocks. There's something to be trampled under feet. And once they've trampled those under their feet because they're messing up their mud, they'd rather waller in mud than put your pearls around their neck. And they will trample those pearls underground. And once they've got those pearls buried so that all they can see is mud again, and muck and mire and everything that is contrary to cleanliness and righteousness and holiness, once they've destroyed your vision, your dream, because you've thrown it out there to people who can't interpret it correctly, once they've destroyed it, then they will turn and they will begin to devour you. And they will say to you, if those pearls were so precious, why is it that you can't see them anymore? Why did they so easily get trampled under the mud? If those pearls were so precious... Why are they no longer able to be strung together on a string so that you can wrap them around your neck? Instead, they are scattered all over this pen and you'll never be able to find them again. If those pearls were so precious, that's what pigs do. They turn and they take those pearls that we cast out there and we throw out on social media and every other place and people and things and we put it in the ground that doesn't know how to receive that. And we throw it out there. And they chew it up and they eat it up and sometimes they steal it and they own it. And then they turn around and then they cast you off. You need to hear what I'm going to tell you today. The pig can never be the man. But the man can become the pig. And in our lives there are a lot of people who have become the pig. They're the ones that will take what you share with them prematurely, just like those brothers of Christ. He said, if I let them all know it, if I tell everybody who I am right now, if I do that, this whole thing's going to come crashing down way before it's supposed to. And there are some things that have to take place. The right guy has to put the spear in my side. The right guy has to put the crown of thorns on my head. The right guy has to put that cross on my shoulders. The right guy has to whip me with a cat of nine tails. The right guy has to lead me up the Via Della Rosa. The right guy has to put the vinegar in my mouth. The right guy has to judge me as unworthy to continue to live. The right guy, if one pearl gets out of place, somewhere down the line, the wrong guy will try to do what the right guy was supposed to do and everything I was supposed to be will never come to pass. Do you hear me? Do not give to the dogs what is meant to be holy. And do not cast your pearls before the pigs. Because they will trample them under feet and then they will turn on you. And they will devour you and they will eat you up. And they will do that not because they smack you around and kick you around. They will do that because they get in your face and they say, you never can be. You never will be. You are incapable. I told you you were a loser. I told you you could never add up to anything. And they will get their finger in your face. And they will over and over. And with every pointed finger that they stick in your face they are chomping down on your purpose and on the intent that the father birthed in you with the first breath you ever breathed is anybody hearing me in this place today say this with me timing is everything and again I say this what I said in the very beginning you cannot do any of what I'm preaching today without a right relationship with Yahweh Without a right relationship with Yahweh, what it does is it measures us up and it takes us to a place where we don't know how to rejoice with those who rejoice. I would ask this morning, just an open question. When people rejoice around you in the kingdom, they come into whatever they come into. There's a success, there's a healing, there's a whatever. Do you know how to rejoice with them? Do you really know how to celebrate with them? 
or in the middle of the celebration or the quasi-celebration or whatever level of exuberance that you might display, is in the middle of all of that somewhere, is there the entangled in that, is there the sense of, what about me? Where that sense is, you have not yet learned to really celebrate with them. Because true celebration excludes our desires. True celebration excludes my hopes and dreams. If I am really celebrating, I am celebrating their success. And when I can learn to celebrate their success, doesn't matter whether that would be really good, that would look good on me. That's irrelevant. What's relevant? If I can truly celebrate with them and I can truly rejoice with them, if I can really do that, my day's coming. And if I can do it right with them, whoever's celebrating with me will do it right with me. Your day's coming. Your day's coming. If it hasn't come already, your day's coming. And there are things in you today. You can't accomplish anything I'm preaching today without a right relationship with the Father. If you're watching online, you cannot accomplish anything that I'm talking about today without a right relationship with the Father. You'll never keep it secret without a right relationship with the Father. You want to know whether or not you trust God? If you always have to tell everything. Because you tell everything because you don't believe that He can. You tell everything because you don't believe, you, you just think that the only way people are going to know how special you are is if you get it out there. People don't know how special we are because we're talking. They know how special we are because of how we're living. Is anybody hearing me today? We want to accomplish this thing with us, with the Father. We want to accomplish the dreams, the visions He's put in our heart. Our, right, our relationship, it has got to be right with Him. It has got to be right. Has anyone thrown pearls to you? And you've kicked them under the table? Don't, don't even nod. But I want today to conclude this service by giving all of us an opportunity to repent for the times that someone put their pearls in our hands and we threw them out the window. Maybe not to their face, but while we were driving down the road and they had long since left our presence. They trusted us with that dream and that vision. And to their face, we might have said, absolutely. But when we walked away, we said, man, there's no way they're ever going to be able to do that. The only way that any of this works for any of us is if all of us can walk away, walk out of this building today with clean hands and pure hearts. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is when we walk out of this building today, whatever he puts in you, don't feel the need to tell everybody about everything that's going on in your world. There's some things that belong to you. What should be kept in secret until its appointed time? 